Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our 10 a.m. worship service here at Seminary Church. We welcome those who are in the sanctuary as well as those who are streaming online. My name is Chris. I serve as a pastor here, and I, my wife and I have been here for a little bit more than a year, and we love it here. As you may know, our church is committed to reaching out to our community, and perhaps a no better finer example of this is that this Friday night we will be attending the Roanoke Farmers Market sponsoring a kids zone so again for those of us who will be there this Friday we're going to try to reach out to the community the women of faith will be having a bake sale we're just trying to reach out letting people know about the good news of Jesus Christ if you have any special prayers 
feel free to complete. There are blue prayer cards in the pews, or if you have any things you'd like to let us know, please fill it out as well. We can pass it in the offering plates as you exit the service. Today, and for the next 45 minutes, we're going to try something different. Now, I know, I know, sometimes different is scary. But we're going to try something different today, and here's how it's going to start off with. First things first, in today's sermon, today's illustration, we talk about conversion. And I want us to consider our own conversion. Now, I know, I know, sometimes we have different stories. In fact, no two conversion really looks the same. So I want to be sensitive to that. Some of us might have grown up in church our whole lives. We never can really think about a conversion. But in our story from today, Paul we learn that he had a dramatic conversion. So, here are the directions for the next few minutes for our warm-up today. If you want to participate, gather with a few people near you, and maybe try to mingle with people you, you do not know if possible, and share about your Christian journey. Now I know, some of you might have said, I didn't show up for this. You didn't tell me we were going to do this, Pastor. But here's my thought. You all, I've been praying for this all week. I've been praying for the right people to be here. And the fact that you're here today is confirmation that God's at work. So for the next few minutes, gather the people nearest to you. Again, try to mingle with people you do not, do not know if possible and share about your Christian journey. Let's begin our worship service today. Yes, come on in. Come right on in. We're uh, gathered with a few people nearest you and try to share your Christian journey. All right. It's okay. <laughs> get her. Get her. That's right. You're not in the main. Welcome right in. We're, we're, uh, take a few minutes to share your Christian journey with people nearest to you. We'll go about four more minutes. If you haven't switched it up, try to switch it up a little bit. <laughs> it's 
Chelsea don't hog all the time. <laughs> no, I'm just joking, just joking. Two minutes left, two minutes left. All right, I know we could talk forever, but let's try to wrap it up. I'll invite the worship team to come forward, the worship team to come forward. Let's see. Again, I told you that today was going to be different, so thanks for coming out today. We will have an opening prayer, and then we'll have our worship team get going. Just want to have our opening prayer over there. Will you pray with me? God of wisdom, there is so much work to be done in proclaiming the good news of eternal life in Jesus and participating in the reign of justice on the earth as it is in heaven. Surprise us with the new mission that you have for our lives. Empower us, broken vessels that we are, to do your work. Thank you for this time that we've had to share our story and your story in our lives with each other. Help us to continue to grow close to one another and deepen our faith in you, Lord, as a church. Thank you for all of these things. And we pray that you just show up in a mighty way for our service today. In the name of the risen Jesus who appeared to Saul on the road, we pray. Amen.
please stand and sing with us as we sing our first song together. This is Good God Almighty. Going to need you to get those <coughs> hands clapping. One, two, ready, and. I can't count the times I called your name so broken. Are there things we could pray for this week? Do we have any things heavy on our hearts? Yes. Prayers for Keith this Thursday, having a procedure to help the, relieve the pressure on the heart. sure the doctors explained that and it sounds a little scary. A little too, yeah. So definitely prayers for that. Thank you. Are there other things to uplift in prayer or in praise as we go into our worship this week? Yes.
prayers for George's son, Chris, and his wife, Haley, who's currently in labor. That is something to pray for, that prayers for a safe delivery. Anything else to uplift in prayer as we head into worship this week? Yes. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, prayers for, yes, um, Huntington University, for the faculty, for the staff, for the teachers, for the students. Um, gosh, I know Miss John's at freshman English, like, am I the right kid? You know, so it's sometimes like prayers for all that. Yes, thank you, Lord. Yes, please. Thank you, Lord. We go hand in hand for prayers for the Gross family as Grace returns to Grace College. It's it's amazing how many things can happen in a week. Um, yeah. So let us go to our time of prayer today. We're going to read responsively a, a liturgy that's on the screen. Um, what I'll do is I'll be a leader. I'll, I'll say forth what we will pray, and if you would just respond with all with hear our prayer. That'll be how we can make things happen. Gracious God, you offer us the free gift of everlasting life through faith in Jesus. Soften our hearts to accept your love and extend that same love to others. O oh God of grace. Inclusive God, you open your arms to all people and welcome them into your fold just as they are. Give us similar spirit of inclusion and radical welcome. O oh God of grace. Liberating God, you free your people from the bonds of sin and death. Expose the bonds of injustice that hold us all captive as perpetrators or victims and equip us to work for freedom. O oh God of grace. O oh generous God, you have given us your spirit and many gifts. Help us to use these gifts with love for the many purpose of serving your region, your serving your reign. O oh God of grace, powerful God, even though Jesus was equal to you, he became humble. Now through him, we can do all things. So give us your authority and strength to carry out the ministry that you have given us to do. O oh God of grace, relational God, you embody perfect love and community. So heal the rifts in our community and world. And give us the patience and love in our relationships. O oh God of grace. And compassion of God. Some of our families, members, and friends have died before seeing you return. Grant them your eternal rest and bring us comfort that they are included with us in your divine plan. O oh God of grace. And Lord, this week we uplift the prayers in our own congregation. Lord, we ask you special prayers for Mary Rollins, for Lynn Swainer, for Diana Hathaway's brother, for Kevin Lufan, for Deb Bullion's mother, for Peggy's son Nick, for Kevin Blackburn and family, John Bartram, for Keith as he goes through his surgery for this Thursday. Lord, be with him. Be with the doctors and nurses. Allow them to perform this with excellence so that he can recover. Lord, please be with Chris and Haley as Haley is in labor. Lord, be with all those at Huntington College and all the colleges who are resuming this week. Lord, be with the, the students and the faculty and the staff and the, the parents as this time of transition begins. And Lord, be especially with those in our own midst, like Grace Gross, Lori Pele, and Amy Finn, as they prepare for this period. And with that, let us conclude this time of prayer by reciting the Lord's Prayer together as we say it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
and he forgives those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Can we stand one more time and bless our hands now? Good, good God. children are kids come on down word for right. children's message <laughs> come on down pastor heather's here this morning yes i got shell we're all god's kids anyway aren't we you know what i'm going to get you to sit right here uh because or would you like to sit there do you have a preference you want to sit there so the congregation can see you that's great well i brought something special to show you all do you know what this is it's a Bible. Do you know what's inside the Bible? 
Oh, that's great. You, do you have a favorite story about God or Jesus? Well, you know what? I bet you will by this time next week because we've got something special for you. Because let, let's ask our friends out there, what's your favorite Bible story? When you were a child or now? Come on, folks. Prodigal son, okay. David and go. Oh, yes. Who else? The key. Oh, I connect with that. Me, little man. Okay. Yes. Jesus walking on what? You know, the, the Bible is filled with stories of God's love for us and stories about God's people, both before Jesus was born. And then after Jesus is born, after Jesus is born, it's just this little part, but there's all these stories about the story. And so for you today, and for all our other friends, Cole, by the way, is at the state fair. He qualified for kitty tractor. Well, he wanted to help me today. We've got a special book that's got Bible stories, one for every day of the next year. You know, you started back to school, you've got books to read from school, well now you've got stories to read every night, Bible stories that either you can read or your mom could read or your dad could read to you. So every night, spend about 10 minutes or so so that we learn about Jesus. And we bought extra ones, so if there are grandparents out there and Friends and children, if you would like to have one to tell a story to young children so that they can learn about Jesus, we want to make that a priority this next year. Because I shared this with the first service. Now, some of us that are a little older remember a contemporary band called Burlap to Cashmere. Some of you aren't connecting to us anyway. One of the songs they had was about the Bible, and they talked about it being basic instructions before leaving Earth. I love that acronym. So um, we're going to learn about the things that we can do here to build the kingdom of God in this community by some of the stories. Would you like to pray with me, Paul? Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you, God, for children. Thank you, God, for the learning that takes place in school and at home. And help us to know more about you each day and grow in wisdom like Jesus did. Amen. Okay. Remember that God loves you, that I love you, Pastor Chris loves you. Um, I'm just going to give her the mic for the sermon. <laughs> You're going to put me out of work, and that's okay. That's a, Please, please do. Great job. Great job. Yes. The scripture for today is taken from Acts. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 22. And as, and as I read it, listen for again the conversion. Today we're focusing on conversion. So it's Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 22. It reads like so. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Saul, a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard reports, many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all those who call upon your name. The Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who called upon his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews, living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. When I first felt nudged to go and become a pastor and to go to seminary, I must admit, I was a little surprised. Growing up, I wasn't too particularly religious. Even though I was at church all the time on the weekends, I guess you wouldn't really consider myself devout. And I guess if I'm truly honest with you, you would think that God would choose someone to represent him who was kind of excited about church growing up and and was really passionate and maybe from a young age was excited to become a pastor. But truth be told, When I was about the age of 18, I looked at the pastor who was at our church and kind of said to myself, you know, being a pastor is probably the last thing I really want to do. And so every now and then I kind of think to myself, God, why did you really choose me? And I guess when I see the good things that have been come, I kind of am baffled like, God, how do you continue to use me? And I'm curious, God, what do you even want from me in the first place? And I guess you could say, long story short, I began to recognize that God saw something in me that I did not see in myself. And looking back, so many great things have happened when I said yes to the call. I, would, I love what I'm doing now. I would not change anything in the world. But I guess I look back and sometimes chuckle. Because I think to myself, God had seen something in me that I hadn't seen in myself. Perhaps you can relate to this. Not necessarily about a call to ministry per se, but a call to be nudged by God to do something outside your comfort zone. I'm going to take a show of hands here because we got some, everyone's quiet here. Let's, let's see. Has God ever asked you to do something outside your comfort zone? Let's have a let's show of hands here. Okay, okay. So maybe you can relate to this. You can relate to this. Here's just a couple of examples. Maybe God called you to be a mother, but you never received the manual. 
Maybe God called you to move to a new city, start teaching first grade, and coach a high school soccer team at a new school, and you never thought you were going to do this again. Maybe you can relate to this. Maybe as God has called you to start a new job or work in a new career or work the overnight shift or lead a college, a business, an organization, in your heart you think to yourself, God, there's no way I'm competent to do this. Maybe you've always struggled with your relationship with God. And then the pastor asks, hey, would you mind leading the Bible study? And you think to yourself, now, pastor, pastor, there's no way I'm ready to do this. I mean, the stories go on and on and on. Maybe you are the only believer in your household, and God has called you to be a missionary to your family. Have you ever been that guy at Thanksgiving dinner? Hey, pass the mashed potatoes. Hey, have you ever talked about Jesus? You know, it's like, they're like, oh, just shut up. Like, come on. Pass the mashed potatoes. And sometimes God gives us things that we don't, maybe they're not God-ordained, but he allows us to go through them. Sometimes God allows us to endure chemotherapy, suffer through cancer, endure the, one of, the loss of a loved one, give the eulogy at their funeral. I mean, the stories go on and on. It seems like God is constantly pushing us to do something outside of our comfort zone. And it's sometimes it's almost like God asks us to do things that are against the grain of who we naturally are. Have you ever felt like this? It's like, God, do you want me to suffer? If you've ever felt like this, then I can say this, then you are in good company. If you've noticed this trend in your life, I'm actually here to do today to say that this is actually good news because here's what we learned from the story today, that God takes ordinary people like you and me, and through the magic of baptism, the Holy Spirit descending, He comes down and infuses us to do things that we never thought we could do, like parenting children or becoming the presidents of organizations. And we see this no better than the life of Paul. In the past weeks, we've been reading through the book of Romans. We've been studying the book of Romans. But today, I thought for the first time, wait a second, we don't know this man's story. And so rather than talk about the exegesis of salvation and redemption and sanctification, Today, instead of talking about actual Romans, I thought to tell you his story. I mean, if you don't know about Paul, he's kind of a big deal. He wrote over 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. His epistles are vital roots of theology and worship and pastoral life in the Protestant West traditions. He went on missionary trips, started churches, went on to Corinth and Rome and Jerusalem and Spain, influenced people like Augustine and John Calvin and Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp. This guy was hugely influential. So you would imagine that he would have a pedigree conducive for him to be in the upper echelons of the Christian faith. You would imagine that he was a saint growing up. But I guess what's so shocking about this text from today is that this guy was far from a saint. And in fact, he was more like a sinner. Today we're going to learn a little bit more about his story. We first meet him in Acts chapter 7, verse 58. And there's a guy named Stephen who preached this wonderful sermon explaining how the Old and New Testament came to fulfillment in Christ. And right at that moment of the culmination, all the bystanders, some were praising him, but some couldn't stand it. And the ones who couldn't stand it, they went over to this man named Saul, and they took off their cloaks and laid it at his feet and began to take up stones and throw stones at this man named Stephen. And he authorized this beating, eventually killing this man named Stephen. That's Paul, the author of our book. When we actually meet him, in Acts chapter 9, he's continually persecuting the church. He goes to the Jews, followed the Jews in Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth. He started chasing the apostles. And we first see him in chapter 9. That's the verse we read from today. Look at what it says in verse 1 and 2. This is Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out numerous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked them for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them 
as prisoners to Jerusalem. This is our man. The author of Romans still at it again, hunting down Christians, following them wherever they go. And at this very moment, he actually has letters in his back pocket to go and persecute more Christians. And he's on his way to Damascus. He's launching a fierce campaign. He can't wait to drag out these disciples and beat them and persecute them. And right then, that's the hero of our book. The hero. So then what happens to Saul or Paul along the way? Look at what verse 3 says. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice to him saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus who are you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless, for they heard the sound but did not see anyone. I mean, that's our story from today. Paul is on his route to go persecute believers when the Lord Jesus shows up. And right in the middle, when he thinks he's going to continue his persecution, the Lord flashes a light. He stuns. He can't see. For three days, he doesn't eat or drink and know what to do. He doesn't know how to act. He doesn't know what to say. He's frightened. He's praying. He's fasting. He's contemplating what God should do. And then, and later on in verse In that chapter, verse 17, we see God send a man named Ananias to go lay hands on Saul. And you can see Ananias' first reaction. You want me to go lay your hands on and pray for this guy? I've heard about this guy. He has a reputation, so to speak. Yet Ananias did it anyway, and it says that immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. And he took his food and regained his strength and at once began to proclaim in the synagogues that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Isn't that a remarkable thing? Because here's what gets interesting. Act 1. Paul's an enemy of God. Act 2. Paul's baptized and has a conversion. And Act 3. He's a champion for God. Paul didn't have to enroll in a 12-step program. He didn't have to go through a 10-year journey of becoming a disciple. He didn't have to go around to explain to everyone how he hurt. How he didn't have to go around to explain to everyone who he hurt and explain things. Did you catch what the rescue was? Paul was far from God. Paul was baptized, had a fall. And now Paul was a champion for God. And the reason I tell you all that is quite frankly to tell you this. If that's God's recipe for a man like that, why do you discount what God's doing in your life? Church, I'm serious. You tell yourself, God, you don't know what I've done. God, you don't know who I've done. God, you don't know how many times I've done it. And look at what happens in this text from today. Sinner, baptized, called, champion. It's the ABCs. Baptized, called. And I guess what's so fascinating about this text from today is that same recipe has been used on me, has been used on you, and yet all the time, Everywhere we go to God and say, God, I can't do this. God, I'm not good enough. God, I'm not strong enough. God, I'm not wise enough. I can't lead a family. I don't pray enough. We tell God all the reasons we can't do things instead of saying yes to God for the reasons that he's called us to. Let's say you find yourself suited to become a mother. What's the first thing you might think about? I'm not ready for this. For those of you who became a mother, what's what's the first thing you thought about? You're like, oh yeah. Let's say you've been tasked with leading a university. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? Let's say you've been tasked with coaching soccer at a new school. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? Let's say you've asked to become a leader at your employee. 
What's a person that goes through your mind? I mean, we talk ourselves out of it all the time. And yet what's so fascinating about this text is in one breath, Paul, formerly Saul, is hunting down Christians, eager to slay them. And the next breath, he's becoming a full-blooded missionary, proclaiming Jesus Christ. And I guess I'm here today to say that, yes, we all are human. Yes, we all have fallen short. But if he was a candidate for ministry based off of his life, then how do we rule ourselves out? Imagine the difference of our lives if we all lived our authentic Christian witness. Imagine what your life could truly be. Imagine that the change that could take place in you, in your place of work, instead of going from a scared, nervous leader to someone who's always self-doubting. What if you became a gospel-centered, Christ-leading, megastar witness who's been tasked with leading a university to change? Instead of thinking you're some new kid at a school who can't make a world of difference, what if God had ordained you for this time and place? Instead of telling God all the reasons that you don't measure up, you don't add up, you can't make it work, instead of listening to what God's telling you, stop telling me that you don't have what it takes and start doing what I've told you to do. This story is a reminder that all it takes for someone to be used by God is to be called, baptized, and sent. And I guess, to be honest, as we begin to wrap things up, it kind of goes deeper than this. Because everyone here, Christian theology and Christian doctrine says this, we are all the saints redeemed. Look around to the people to your left. Look around to the people to your right. These people are not here by accident. These people are people that God has called. We are meant to be a body of believers. We're not just ordinary people. We're ordinary people that have been transformed by God's call and our baptism, sent into the world. And what's interesting is some of us came from whole homes. Some of us came from broken homes. Some of us came from rich families. Some of us came from families without any parents. Some of us came from families with two parents, with godparents. We went to private schools. We went to public schools. We may have got kicked out of school, but we call from all these backgrounds and all these problems. And what brings us here today is that we've been baptized and called, and we represent the body of Christ to this world. So here's what we're going to do. As I invite our praise team to come forward, or our special music, we are actually going to come forward and renew and remember our baptism. Listen about this. When Saul changed his mind and believed about Jesus, something like scales fell from his eyes and he was baptized. And baptism marks our naming as children of God in the formal entrance into the body of Christ, the church. Now I get it. Some of us have been baptized as infants or children. I get it. Some of us had a baptism as an adult. I get it. Some of us have never been baptized. Regardless of what that is, I invite us all to come forward today remembering this calling from God, remembering this baptismal experience. And here's what I want us to do. As the music starts playing, I want us all to come forward to the line, to, to the front of the altar. And, and before we have that, I want us to, here's, here's what I want us to do. When you come forward, Turn to the person behind you and lay a hand on the shoulder of the person with their permission. If you do not wish for the person in front of you to touch your shoulder, simply cross your arms over your chest. But again, as you come forward, please turn to the person behind you, laying your hand on the shoulder of that person, laying hands just like Ananias did in response to God's call to him to heal Saul and speak of him to Jesus and say these words to one another, be made whole and receive the Holy Spirit. And after that, we can come forward, sanitize one's hands, and grab a baptismal remember stone from the water. This is what we're going to do today to be reminded of God's calling in our life. Come forward to this time today being reminded that all it takes 
is a baptism and a calling to be used by God. Come forward during this time. Split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Yeah.
as I invite Jenny to come forward to talk about uh, ministry spotlight, I invite the worship team to kind of do the same thing for the baptism. All right. So we have a number of important dates on the horizon at Seminary Church. You've come to the right place. We are going to the farmer's market. We are doing fall floats. But one thing I want to uplift today, well, I think Jenny can say it better than me. Jenny, what, what's on our horizon? So we have... So, so we have a Nelson's chicken, um, chicken dinner fundraiser coming up on September 7th, which is the Wednesday right before fall break. Um, we are going to be selling these tickets from now until then. Um, if you could give them back to me maybe that Sunday right before, um, that would be wonderful. That way we'll kind of know how many tickets we need to still sell. Um, and that are free for the community to come in and buy and purchase. So this year the ticket is going to be for $12. Um, and the reason why we raised it a dollar is because we're going to add a bottle of water to it as well. So they have the entire meal that they have, including the drink, and that they can eat it down at the park. Mm -hmm. So please come see me for tickets to sell. I can give, give you to them in groups of 10 or in groups of 5, whatever you want, whatever you think you would be able to sell. The fundraiser is going to go for helping the church continue on with our fun Friday night. Um, we're going to do one, once a month, and we will be using that those funds to help buy pizza and bring families into the church, kind of like game night, that type of thing. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. As she mentioned, there are a number of events on the horizon at Seminary Church. I'll just direct your attention to the bulletin. There's a number of events listed there tree to uplift would be simply this. This Friday, we're going to be at the Roanoke Farmer's Market. There's going to be a bake sale. If you would like to bring anything to bake or just come there for the volunteer for the fun zone, talk to Vicki. There's a sign-up sheet. I think it's in the back. Second, market calendars. On September 4th, we have a big day. First of all, we're having one service together. What day was that? September. September That's 4th. right. I feel like September fourth. Instead of uh, so, yeah, ten a.m. here, and then that Sunday there's also a tog roast at Mark and Terry Whitman's house. Sunday, September fourth at four p.m. There are a number of other things to announce, but just look in the bulletin for that. All right. Before we begin our last hymn, I just want to also say thank you for continuing to support the church through your tithes and offerings. Your generosity here continues to allow us to support the mission and the, the ministry here. There are offering plates at both sanctuary entrances and also, I think, a QR code in the bulletin. Where we thank you for your generosity and support. It's only because of you that we're able to be here. And as we go to our closing hymn, I invite, I'll, I'll toss it over to Chelsea. Chelsea, what's next? Will you stand with us as we sing our closing song, Holy Water? One, two, ready, go. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please, again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down. I need you. Oh, 
Let's close our worship today by a closing prayer and a spoken blessing. So gracious God, anything is possible for you. You can melt even the hardest heart. So we ask you to soften our hearts today. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And now as a blessing, turn to the person next to you and make the sign of the cross on their shoulder or forehead with permission and repeat the following. God can use you to spread the gospel. So turn to the person next to you, make the sign of the cross on their forehead or uh, shoulder with permission and repeat the following. God can use you to spread the gospel. Go in peace. Chris.